Say you are a metaphorical child plopped into this strange and complex universe, and it's your job to figure out the mechanics underlying it all. What is everything made of, and what rules do these things obey? What would you do to figure it all out? Maybe you would try taking things apart. Your toys, for example. If you pull apart the different pieces, you can reveal the internal gears. You might learn about a car in the same way. You'd open up the hood and see what's inside. The life of a physicist is sometimes like that of this child, but when it comes down to the most fundamental objects and rules, there's really not a hood to pop open. We can't just peek into the inner workings of an atom. So instead, the metaphorical child physicist comes up with the next best option. You throw the damn thing at the ground and see what happens. This is basically the concept behind particle colliders. Big machines throwing particles at each other at super high energies have proven to be one of the most effective ways physicists have to learn about the world. This method doesn't work for cars, it doesn't work for baseballs, it doesn't work for any other macroscopic objects I can think of, but it turns out this is really the best way we have to understand the fundamental constituents of matter and energy and the laws that dictate their behavior. In today's episode, we're going to dive deep into particle colliders. Why do physicists build them? What do they do? And what have they taught us about the fundamental rules of physics? This episode of Why This Universe is supported by Wondrium. Wondrium is a mind-blowing subscription service that offers thousands of video and audio courses on a huge range of topics. I've been a big fan and a regular consumer of Wondrium's content for the past 15 years or so, and over that time I've listened to dozens of their courses including ones on history, philosophy, literature, math, and science. For me, it's kind of like taking an intro-level university course from a great professor on a subject you've always wanted to know more about, but without the big tuition fee and all in the comfort of your own home or daily commute. I recently started listening to a series of lectures on Wondrium called Theories of Knowledge, How to Think About What You Know. The subject of epistemology is probably my favorite area of philosophy, and this course is, provides a great introduction in all the deep and messy questions that come with trying to figure out what we really know and how and why we know what we know. So if you want to learn more about epistemology or really just about anything else, give Wondrium a try. You can sign up for Wondrium now through our special URL to get a month of unlimited access for free. Just go to wondrium.com universe. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash U-N-I V E R S E. You're listening to Why This Universe, a podcast where we break down the biggest ideas in physics. I'm Shalma Wegsman. And I'm Dan Hooper. For the past century, physicists have been building particle colliders as a way to learn about the fundamental workings of the universe. But to understand why, let's go back to the early 20th century. At this time, physicists had started to become convinced that matter is made up of atoms, but they didn't know much about the atoms themselves. They didn't know what they were made of, how they were shaped, or how they worked. They could just kind of barely start to see evidence that atoms existed at all. Electrons had been discovered about a decade earlier by the physicist J.J. Thompson, but we still didn't know anything about protons or neutrons. They hadn't been discovered yet or any kind of atomic nuclei. Uh, we were all pretty much in the dark about how atoms were shaped or how they work. Our best guess for how atoms were kind of constructed at the time was something called the plum pudding model. According to this theory, atoms were basically just a big blob of positively charged matter with a number of negatively charged electrons embedded at different places throughout this blob. Apparently, I, I don't really know what this plum pudding thing is, but apparently it's some sort of traditional English food. <laughs> um, I get it, get that it's like a cake with some raisins in it or something. Right, it's like the name is as outdated as the theory itself. <laughs> Well, actually, I don't know if they still eat plum pudding in England. They might. Sure. I lived in England for two years, and I don't recall it coming up, uh, but I wouldn't swear that I've never had. So let's say you were a physicist around this time, and you wanted to test the plum pudding model. You wanted to find out if atoms really were more or less like big blobs of positively charged matter with some electrons sprinkled in. Now, of course, this was just a hypothesis at the time. It like wasn't an established theory, and it hadn't really been tested. 
So, you know, you want to put it to the test. You want to do some experiments, make some observations, apply the scientific theory and scientific method and try to find out if this theory, you know, holds water or not. So to figure out whether atoms really look like plum pudding, you can imagine that physicists would want to take something of a picture of one. After all, if we can capture some sort of image of an atom, then we can learn its structure. But this isn't so simple. Atoms are really tiny, so small that how far we can zoom in on them is not just limited by our camera capabilities, but also on the actual wavelength of the light that you're using to take the picture with. To think about this, remember that everything we see around us, we can see because of visible light bouncing off of the objects and into our eyes. But for light to bounce off an atom, it has to have a small enough wavelength to actually be affected by the atom in its way. And the smaller the wavelength of a photon, the higher energy it is. A typical width of an atom is something like 10 to the minus 10 meters or around 10 nanometers or so. In contrast, like a typical photon of light uh, in, that you can see with your eyes has uh, a wavelength in the range of like 400 to 700 nanometers. So that means that an individual particle of light is like 40, 50, 60, 70 times bigger than the atom itself. This makes it impossible for us to use visible light to produce anything resembling an image of an atom. So instead, physicists had to use high energy light, like x-rays and gamma rays, to get that picture of an atom. And it's still no simple task. After all, that means aiming your x-rays on an incredibly small target. The main takeaway I want everyone to understand here is that by using higher energy particles, it's possible to learn about smaller things. In this sense, particle accelerators, which produce really high energy particles, allow us to kind of use these machines as microscopes, allowing us to see the structure of some of the smallest things that exist in our universe. So let's go back to the state of physics in 1908. In a series of experiments conducted over a few year period around this time at the University of Manchester in England, a pair of young physicists named Hans Geiger and Ernest Marsden, who were working under the much more famous and, you know, whatever revered physicist Ernest, Ernest Rutherford, basically tried to do this sort of experiment we've been describing. Uh, namely, they bombarded atoms with energetic particles in an effort to learn about the structure of the atoms themselves. But instead of using X-rays or gamma rays, they use what are known as alpha particles. Today, we know that alpha particles are basically the nuclei of helium atoms, two protons and two neutrons all bound together. But at the time, no one really knew what these alpha particles were. It was just known that they were a kind of energetic particle that was you know, known to be radiated from certain kinds of radioactive material. In their laboratory, Geiger and Marsden created a beam of these energetic alpha particles, and they directed that beam toward a thin sheet made of gold. So this sheet was only like a few millionths of a meter thick, and that roughly corresponds to like a thickness of a couple of thousand atoms wide. So a really, really thin sheet. The beam of alpha particles hit the sheet of the gold atoms, and then Geiger and Marsden measured the directions of the outgoing alpha particles use, using a, a device involving a fluorescent screen. So let's think about what Geiger and Marsden should have expected to see in their experiment. Well, the electrons are really small in light, so they shouldn't be able to deflect the alpha particles much at all. It's kind of like throwing a baseball at a pile of ping pong balls or something. Even if you have a direct hit, the baseball just keeps going. The, the ping pong ball doesn't have enough mass to really impact the baseball's movement at all. And we can then ask about what about the positively charged part of the atom? According to the plum pudding model, the positively charged matter is all spread out. So it's kind of a diffuse pudding of this charged material, and that shouldn't really be able to deflect the alpha particles at all. So if the plum pudding model was right, then these alpha particles should have passed straight through the gold foil without really experiencing any kind of deflection at all. So that's what Marsden and Geiger probably expected to see. After all, the plum pudding model was the leading theory of the time, but it's not what they actually saw when they did the experiment. So most of the alpha particles did what they expected. They passed straight through the gold foil, nothing really happened. But to the surprise of Geiger and Marsden, a small fraction of the alpha particles 
were really strongly deflected, bouncing off of the thin gold sheet and flying off in pretty much random directions. In some cases, the alpha particles even bounced off the sheet and recoiled back to where they came from. So this is kind of like throwing that baseball at a pile of ping pong balls and every once in a while, one bounces off the ping pong balls and just shoots right back at you. It just doesn't make sense, at least from the plum pudding model perspective. Now, if I threw a baseball at something and that baseball bounced back off whatever it hit back in my direction, I could be pretty sure that whatever it hit must be pretty heavy. It'd have to be at least as heavy as a baseball itself and probably a lot heavier than that. So what Geiger and Marsden concluded from the behavior of these alpha particles was that they must be hitting something really heavy and that something is what we now call an atomic nucleus. There was no diffuse plum pudding of positive electric charge. Instead, these experiments revealed that the atoms they were targeting consist of some rather light electrons, all surrounding a much heavier and much more compact nucleus that carry the positive charge. This 1908 plum pudding experiment can be thought of as the first time physicists made a groundbreaking discovery through the process of throwing particles at each other. In this case, throwing alpha particles at atoms. It turns out that using energetic particles as colliders can help us resolve behavior at very small scales. And the higher the energy of the particles you're using, the smaller the scale you can probe with them is. But this isn't the only reason that physicists like to use really energetic particles. The other reason has to do with Einstein's most famous equation, the E equals MC squared, that everybody you know, hears about in pop culture. What this equation basically says is that mass is just one form of energy, and under the right circumstances or conditions, you can take energy and convert it into mass, and you can take mass and convert it back into energy. For example, we could take some ordinary electrons or protons, accelerate them up to speeds near the speed of light, collide them together, putting a lot of energy at one place at one time, and try to convert that energy into exotic forms of, of matter, like things like W bosons and top quarks, tau leptons, or even the Higgs boson. These sorts of, of particles that we don't see sitting around in our universe, but that are part of the fabric of space and time and, and are the sort of things that we can manufacture in these carefully constructed particle collider environments. Making use of E equals MC squared means that no matter what particles we're starting with in a collision, the energy release can produce countless other particles. This is a brilliant way for physicists to observe particles that don't normally hang out around us, often because they're unstable and decay very quickly. It also means that by running these experiments, we are probing what particles in the universe were doing way back in the early universe, where everything was hotter and collisions were much more energetic. Through these particle collisions at our experiments, we're peeking into the hyperactivity of the very early universe. So now we know why particle colliders are so important and why it is that they are so good at showing us new physics. But how are these colliders actually built? In order to collide particles at high enough energies to produce these important collisions, you need a machine that can accelerate particles. The faster you can get the particles moving, the more energy they have to be released. The first particle accelerators were constructed back in the 1930s, and these were called cyclotrons. Cyclotrons were basically like circular rings around which electromagnetic fields were used to propel particles like protons or nuclei. In other words, electromagnetic fields are fields which affect charged particles, particles with positive or negative charge. And if you're clever about where you place these fields, they can be used to speed up or deflect those particles. That makes electricity and magnetism a core part of how particle accelerators function. There was a cyclotron at Berkeley, for example, that managed to get protons moving around its ring at about 15,000 kilometers per second, which is like 5% of the speed of light. That's pretty slow by modern standards, but it was a pretty important step forward at the time. Apart from these early cyclotrons, there was another way that particle collisions were coming into physics in the early 20th century. It turns out that if you look up into our atmosphere, there is something of a natural particle collider taking place. And that's because every second, tens of thousands of particles from space called cosmic rays are hitting each square meter of Earth. These cosmic rays collide with the particles in our atmosphere, 
and the result is a high energy particle collision. We can actually observe these, and a few of the known types of particles were actually discovered this way because of observations of cosmic ray events. For example, the muon, which is essentially a heavy and unstable version of an electron, was discovered originally in 1936 by Carl Anderson, who detected muons that were produced in the cosmic ray interactions in the Earth's atmosphere. Anderson also discovered antimatter in this way in 1932, when he detected the first positron in the cosmic rays. Other particles, including pions, kaons, and lambda baryons, were all discovered during this era using cosmic rays. But by the 1950s or so, physicists were forced to kind of move away from cosmic rays. They weren't, you know, teaching us anything about particles from that point on. And instead, they increasingly tried to create new weird particles in particle accelerators. That was their new way of getting at the kinds of particles that could exist. When we measure cosmic rays, we are kind of at the whim of whatever happens to hit Earth. But in particle accelerator experiments, physicists can control everything, from what particles you start with, to what energy they have, and we can make sure that we have an abundant amount of detectors surrounding each of the collision sites. This makes these experiments extremely powerful, and so physicists started building them, with the goal of accelerating particles as close to the speed of light as possible. At the Brookhaven National Lab, for example, a machine called the Cosmotron was used in the 1950s and 60s to accelerate protons to about 97.5% of the speed of light. This allowed them to produce a bunch of different kinds of particles known as mesons. Around the same time at Berkeley, the Bevatron accelerator got protons moving at over 99% of the speed of light, which gave them the chance to produce a bunch of new kinds of particles, including things called strange mesons, as well as antiprotons and antineutrons, the antimatter counterparts of the proton and neutron. As time went on, the accelerators that physicists were building got bigger and more powerful, and they were able to accelerate more particles to higher and higher energies. By the 1980s, protons were being accelerated to more than 99.99% of the speed of light. The Fermilab Tevatron, which operated from 1983 until 2011, produced both protons and antiprotons, each moving at over 99.99995% of the speed of light. It sounds like a small change, but that's like a huge difference in energy for these protons. That last nine really does add a lot of energy. At this incredible speed, the collisions of these particles were able to create the particles we call top quarks, which to this day are the most massive kind of particle that we've ever observed. A single top quark has a mass of about 173 GeV, which is about 184 times as heavy as a single proton. Coming to today, there are two general types of particle colliders. The first, called fixed target colliders, will accelerate one stream of particles and smash it into a target that's at rest. These accelerators generally have limited reach in terms of the total energy that's present in each collision, but they can collide a huge number of particles together. So as you can imagine, this has some advantages as well as some disadvantages compared to alternatives. The main alternative to fixed target experiments are what we call particle colliders. So these are machines that accelerate not one beam of particles, but two beams, and then those beams are directed head on into one another. These collisions have a lot more energy in them than at a fixed target experiment, but it's generally harder to observe the same kind of number of collisions, um, and they're just much more technically difficult to construct and operate. So again, there's kind of an upside and a downside to both of these approaches. So we have these two kinds of machines, we have the fixed target experiments, which fire a beam of particles at a target at rest, and particle colliders, which collide two beams together into each other. But in addition to this distinction, there's another big difference among different particle accelerators based on what kinds of particles are being accelerated and collided into one another. Most of these machines accelerate either electrons, protons, or their antiparticles, positrons and antiprotons. Colliders using electrons and positrons tend to be cleaner in the sense that the stuff that comes out of these collisions tends to be a bit, you know, a lot less messy and easier for the physicists running these machines to measure and kind of make sense of. This is a big advantage of electron-positron colliders. The most famous electron-positron collider was the LEP collider at the CERN laboratory in Switzerland. LEP was operated from 1989 until 2000. 
And at its peak, it collided electrons and positrons together with a total energy of 209 GeV, which is still the record for electrons and positrons. To do this, they used powerful magnets distributed around a 27 kilometer underground circular tunnel or ring. So the downside to using electrons and positrons in these machines is that they tend to lose energy pretty quickly. Um, this is because of what are known as synchrotron energy losses. And because electrons are relatively light particles, these sorts of energy losses affect them pretty strongly. As an electron is accelerated around a circular ring, it gives off low energy photons in response to being accelerated. So that carries away some energy. So you can use an electromagnetic field to accelerate the electrons, but the faster you get them going, the more quickly they lose energy to these synchrotron losses. And uh, eventually you kind of hit a wall. Um, this, this makes it hard to accelerate electrons and positrons to as high of energies as we might have otherwise wanted to. And it's not, again, a, a fundamental speed limit or something, but it's, it's a, a technical barrier, a, yeah, a practical barrier that engineers have to contend with. So if, if your goal is really to collide particles with the maximum possible energy, you probably don't want to use electrons and positrons, but instead you want to use heavier particles like protons or antiprotons. Um, I mentioned the Fermilab Tevatron before, um, and they used a much smaller tunnel than the LEP accelerator did. Um, it's only 6.3 kilometers around compared to 27 kilometers. But because they were accelerating these heavier particles, protons and antiprotons, they reached energies that were almost 10 times as high as those attained at LEP. So in a nutshell, electrons are really great for making precise measurements because those collisions are so clean, but protons are best for achieving the highest possible energies. Today, the world's great particle accelerator is an incredible machine called the Large Hadron Collider, or we just usually call it the LHC for short. The LHC is an extremely high energy proton-proton collider and it's the single most powerful tool we have today for understanding the fundamental forms that matter and energy can take in our universe. In the next episode of Why This Universe, we're going to pick up where we left off today and take a deep dive into the LHC, explain how it works, what it's taught us so far, and what we hope it might discover in the years ahead. Why This Universe is brought to you by the University of Chicago Podcast Network. It's edited and produced by me, Shalma Wegsman, and my co-host is Dan Hooper, a professor of astrophysics at the University of Chicago and Fermilab. If you like our show and you want to support us even more, you can find us on Patreon. There you can access ad-free episodes of the show as well as exclusive Ask Us Anything episodes where you get to ask Dan and I direct questions about physics or anything else. So if you are curious about that, you can find it at patreon.com slash why this universe. Thank you so much for listening and for your support. Each moving at over 99.999. <laughs> we can get that again.